Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Michael Spath, and I'm the Executive Director of the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace, based in Fort Wayne, Indiana. We're the Indiana Voice for Peace, Justice, Human Rights, and Intercultural Encounter. I'm also a member of the Palestine-Israel uh, Palestine Israel Network of the United Church of Christ. We're delighted today to speak with Brooklyn-born Palestinian Muslim activist, author, and proud mother of three, Linda Sarsour. She chronicles her life and activism in her compelling book published earlier this year, We Are Not Here to Be Bystanders, a memoir of love and resistance. Linda, welcome. Thank you so much, Michael, for having me. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you see a number of uh, names of friends on this screen. I recognize a lot of them as activists from all over the country. So Linda, again, welcome. I want to get to your book. In fact, I've got a number of questions that arise from things you said in your book, but uh, uh, I say this with lots of love and affection. Uh, you're a troublemaker. Uh, already this week, Tuesday, uh, uh, you know, a number of us have been tuning in to the Democratic National Convention. And on Tuesday, your Women's March partner and partner in crime, Tamika Mallory, she spoke at the Democratic Black Caucus, and you appeared on a panel hosted by the DNC's Muslim Delegates and Allies Assembly. I've got some of your quotes here, but why don't I just uh, turn it over to you. Your presence uh, caused a stir among right-wing media, the Republican National Committee, and others, which in turn provoked a response from the Biden campaign. You wanna say a word about what all happened and what you had to say and uh, where you stand with the Democrats right now. Uh, well, thank you for starting there, Michael, just cut to the chase. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, uh, so really the, it, it boils down to exactly what you said. I mean, my existence is uh, my resistance, literally. Like, like my existence, it, it, it triggers the right wing of the United States. And I mean, right wing as in right wing white nationalist, as in right wing Zionist. I mean, this is just who I am. As, and you know, I'm a good troublemaker. This is what I do for a living. Um, I, I dedicated the last 21 years of my life to making good trouble around issues um, that I deeply care about. Um, and so, so just so you get a little bit of the story quickly so people understand context of what Michael's talking about. I'm an official delegate to the DNC. I am an official delegate from the great state of New York on behalf of my favorite um, uh, politician in the history of the United States, which is Senator Bernard Sanders. And I was invited by the Muslim um, Delegates Committee. So let's be clear here. Let's remember what I just said. I am an official delegate to the, to the party. And the Muslim delegates are inviting a Muslim delegate who is one of the one, if not the most prominent Muslim American activist and organizer in the country to speak about Muslim engagement around electoral politics. And in fact, on, in that Muslim assembly that we had, I never mentioned Israel. I never even mentioned BDS. So that's the really interesting part about what happened this week, that this was an unprovoked um, attack on myself, but really more so on the communities that I come from, Michael. Um, I am not a fringe leader in the Muslim American community or in the Arab American and Palestinian American communities. I am quite mainstream, meaning that I hold the views of the overwhelming majority of our community. So what happened was a white man spokesperson for the Biden campaign, um, who does not reflect the type of electorate that we are trying to engage in the party, was cornered by right-wing media and also by Jake Tapper from CNN, who many of you know is not a friend to the Palestinian people nor to the cause of the Palestinian people. And the, the spokesperson was cornered to say, we condemn her views without knowing even what I said, that they condemn my views and that they um, oppose BDS and that they are staunch supporters of the state of Israel and all that, you already know what happened. They go on the rant about how staunchly pro-Israel Joe Biden is. But just so, you're, just so you're clear, Michael, I've been through this many times before, so it doesn't really bother me much, but this time around, uh, it really, really riled up my community in a way that is potentially harmful to the Democratic Party. My community took this personal because when you say that you condemn my views, that means what you're saying is the views that I hold as a Palestinian American in support of Palestinian human rights, in support of the rights of 
you know, refugees to return to their original homeland, that you, I support the, I, I support the idea of coexistence, um, that we as Jews and Palestinians um, and others can live in a state together in a true democracy. Those are the views that 98.7% of Muslim Americans and Arab Americans and Palestinian Americans hold. And so now my community is demanding a retraction and an apology from the Biden campaign to, to reiterate that our views, while some may not agree with them, which is fine, are still welcomed in this big tent Democratic Party. So that's what happened. I was minding my own business, Michael, when this all happened. <laughs> your existence is your resistance is how you put it. And uh, I, I think that speaks volumes. Well, let's, let's get to your book. Uh, I, I did want you to uh, I have an opportunity though, to address that because it's been all over the news. So thank you. The title of your book, We're Not Here to Be Bystanders, uh, as I read your book, came from uh, the graduation commencement address you gave at Harlem's Apollo Theater to the City University of New York School of Public Health. And you devote an entire chapter of your book to that event and the emotion, the emotion which filled you uh, uh, heading into that event and, and subsequent to it. Say a word about the title of your book and that event. My uh, title of my book really embodies who I am, who I try to be every single day, Michael. And I truly believe in my heart that we are not here on this earth to be bystanders to any form of injustice against any community. And that particular uh, title came from a commencement speech that I did at CUNY Graduate Center that I want to put in context to people so people understand what it means to be a Palestinian Muslim American woman organizing on a high level in this country. What happened was when I was announced as the CUNY City University of New York commencement speaker, right-wing Zionists came out of every woodwork that you could imagine possible. The right wing came out, white nationalists, every right wing media outlets came out to attack CUNY, which as you know, is one of the largest uh, college systems that we have in the country, but of course in New York City. And it also represents predominantly low income people of color who attend our CUNY system. And so having me as a product of CUNY having me as a woman of color born and raised in New York City was the perfect person to have as the CUNY commencement speaker. Majority of the graduates were people of color and were from low income communities. And they, in fact, the students chose me as their commencement speaker. And so I was attacked on the highest level possible to the point where every single celebrity alt-right leader in America flew to New York City and actually organized the rally outside of the CUNY administrative offices. Anyone from Milo Yiannopoulos, Richard Spencer, Gavin McGinnis, Dove Hyken, Pamela Geller, you name the Islamophobe and they were there. Yeah. And they called the event Cancel Sarsour. What was beautiful was the response that they got, which was from the CUNY uh, chancellor and also from professors and students across the CUNY system who said, absolutely not. Linda Sarsour will speak at this graduation we will not cancel her. She has the right to say whatever it is she wants to say. New Yorkers, Jewish Americans stood up for me across the country. But amidst all of that, Michael, I was um, I received death threats. I received mail to my home. My children were targeted. This is the life that I have to live every day just, but just for being a vocal, um, a, a vocal Palestinian American. And so what happened was the, 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 the CUNY speech happened at the Apollo Theater. There were more cops at the Apollo Theater than there were graduates and I was very apologetic to the graduates there that that this is the graduation they had to have that they had to be you know so much security and cops and you know what the graduates said to me they said no this is going to be the most memorable graduation that anyone ever had and it is going to be a graduation that goes down in history and so when I went up to the stage Michael as other commencement speakers in the past like Betsy DeVos you know people walk out people turn their backs I received a standing ovation from that entire auditorium. And I was welcomed there with so much love um, for who I am and for what I represent. And the reason why I said we are not here to be bystanders is I shared a story, if many of you remember. There was a story in 2017 where these three young men were in a train station in Portland, Oregon, and a Muslim American girl and her black friend were in the train being harassed and assaulted by a white man in his late 40s. And these men decided that they were not going to be bystanders to this type of hate. And what they did was is they actually put their physical bodies in, in harm's way to the point where two of those men lost their lives. They were stabbed to death. One of them was a father um, who had four children. Another one was um, someone who was very beloved um, in the communities that he came from. 
And only one man lived to tell the story, which is a young poet who lived to tell the story and did not regret one second that he too was harmed, although he was able to continue and of course did, was not killed. So my tribute at the, in the day of that CUNY commencement speech was to say to people, those men decided not to be bystanders. We have to decide not to be bystanders and that we have to every single day decide that when we see injustice happening against any individual or any community, that we have to stand up for them. And Michael, that is my faith that I follow. And it is the, it is the, it is the type of spirit that I have been, um, uh, that, that my parents instilled in me as a Palestinian American. You dedicated that talk to their memory. Absolutely. Yeah. You begin your book, uh, which as I mentioned beforehand, I, it was compelling and I just really appreciated the transparency and honesty of, of your narrative. You begin your book by describing at 19 years old, choosing a particular piece of clothing from a family friend suitcase she brought back from the Hajj uh, uh, in Mecca. You put it on and this is how you describe it. For the first time in my 19 years, I appeared to the world as exactly what I was, unapologetically Muslim. I remember placing a palm over the mound of my belly and thinking simply, this is it. And also you say, all my life, I had yearned for a visible identity in the world. And that morning, seeing my reflection in the hallway mirror, I had found it at last. That was the day I began to feel whole. You want to say more about that for us? And, and the importance of your Muslim faith. You alluded to it just earlier. For me, um, you know, growing up, and I wrote about this in my book, you know, my name is Linda. I was born with that name. My parents, you know, had come to America as new immigrants, you know, came from living under a military occupation. And they wanted to ensure, Michael, that I had the best life that I could have. And I think when you're a new immigrant, my parents made the decision to give me a name that wasn't like Fatma or Khadija or something that would be seen as foreign to the United States, or at least in the perspective of my parents foreign. So giving me a name like Linda, which was, they named me after like a song. And, and so anyway, I grew up, you know, as you can see, fair skinned, I have black hair and my name was Linda and I was a very ambiguous kid. Nobody really knew where I was from and that there was something always empty inside of me. Um, and as I also wrote about in my book, even trying to explain to, you know, kids in your class in middle school that you're Palestinian and trying to go show kids where Palestine was in, on a map and not being able to even do that. There was just a void in my heart and it was there for a really long time. And so for me, I was missing something in my identity and I wanted to show up somewhere and I wanted to, people to know what I was and who I was. And so for me, my hijab became um, a symbol of, of an identity that I could walk into any room, Michael, and the first thing you will know about me is you will know I'm a Muslim. You may not know anything else about me, but you will know I'm a Muslim. And that was very important to me. And as I grew older, um, I wore my hijab when I was 19 years old. And as I continued to organize, I started studying Islam in a way that I hadn't when I was younger. And I became very close um, to my faith, believing that Islam, you know, oftentimes people will say Islam is a religion of peace. And I truly believe that. I believe all Abrahamic faiths and even other faiths like Sikhism and Buddhism and others are, are, are religions of peace. But what's more important to me, Michael, about my faith is that it is a religion of justice. And what I say to people all the time is you cannot have peace without justice. And so I have taken the charge from my faith to stand up for the most marginalized people and to follow in the footsteps of my beloved Prophet Muhammad, may peace and blessings be upon him, who in every story told about him, you would never find him with Pharaoh. You would never find him amongst the powerful people or amongst those he felt to be the most influential. He was always amongst the widows and the orphans and the poor and the sick and the people that he knew needed him the most and the, those that required his mercy. And so what I'm trying to do, Michael, and in and, 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 and my life is I am trying to be a mercy, a mercy to, to the people and show kindness and compassion to people. And I also am a fighter. Um, I believe in truth telling and I don't believe that we can only tell truth when it's comfortable. We have to be able to tell truth all the time. And oftentimes the truth is uncomfortable. And so I have become an uncomfortable leader, um, someone who creates a lot of controversy, not because the things that I say are, are, are wrong. It is because the things that I say are new to people and, not, and people have not been able to hear them on the largest and highest platforms. And so I'm gonna continue to be a truth teller a justice seeker, and someone who will always fight and defend the most marginalized people in my country. The true meaning of jihad. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. 
So I started there, Michael, I don't know for folks who haven't read my book, my editors um, at Simon and Schuster, when I started writing my book, I started the introduction with what is my jihad? And one of my editors was like, really? Is that really where you want to start? And I said to them, listen, it's my book. And I feel like it is my responsibility to take these terms that have been co-opted by the right wing and Islamophobes to in fact put them in a, in a context and to get people to understand these terminology from the perspective of the people who actually, you know, jihad is not an English word, it's an Arabic word. Fluent Arabic speakers should be able to translate these words. Islam, our faith, people who are Muslim should be able to translate these words. So I started my book in that place. And so many people, Michael, who've read my books, people that I've never, ever, um, you know, I, I've never, you know, it spoke to them. I don't even know who they are. You know, women that were like emailing me from like rural Arkansas being like, I read your book and like every, like they couldn't believe how many things in my book, you know, were things that went against everything that they had known before. And so I was, I'm very grateful that I was given an opportunity to write a book from the perspective of the many people that I represent in the communities that I come from. And jihad is an internal struggle. You know, it is my jihad every day, Michael, to be the better, a better person than I was the day before. It is my jihad to, you know, get college degrees. It is my jihad to, you know, raise my children to be the best that they can be. Every single day, all of us, Michael, go through these internal struggles with ourselves. And that is the most important concept of jihad. Does jihad also mean war? And does it mean to defend your faith and defend your land? Of course it does. But, I, but that's, the, that's the last form and the last resort when it comes to this idea of being able to struggle in this world. Absolutely. I want to, uh, I want to take you back to uh, um, uh, the Women's March to January 21st, 2017. That's You've been you've been active on the public scene for for many many years, but but that has been a way that that has been one of the forums by which you became really into the public eye, nationally and globally. Uh, you speak with such joy and pride of that day. This is how you put it in your book. I was my Palestinian grandmother's wildest dream. I stand here before you unapologetically, Muslim American unapologetically Palestinian American, unapologetically from Brooklyn, New York. Sisters and brothers, you are my hope for my community. Tell us a little bit more about that day and the rest of your message. You know, Michael, um, you know, my grandmother was born in 1927, which, which means she was 21 years old when the creation of the state of Israel um, happened. So my grandmother was an adult. You know, I come from a, a displaced family, you know, a family that has experienced a lot at the hands of the Israeli government. And my grandmother, you know, in 2017, when the Women's March happened, to have a Palestinian American woman like me you know, with the type of voice that I have, and also in a hijab, as you can see, was something that it was much bigger than I was. And it was really for the Palestinian people who watched me in Palestine on live stream, um, including my own grandmother, was my grandmother said, I'm going to die a very happy and proud Palestinian grandmother. Wow. And my grandmother did die, Michael, in 2018 after the second women's march. And there, for, for, for people like me who have been so long marginalized in this country, our views marginalized and watching the very country that I live and love, which is the United States of America, continue to fund the occupation of my grandparents and my aunts and uncles and my cousins and those that I love in Palestine. But for my grandmother and my family in Palestine to see the emergence of my voice in this country as a voice of justice for the Palestinian people, not at the expense of everyone, anyone else, Michael. When I say justice for Palestinians, it is not at the expense of the Jews who live with us in that land. Justice for me is justice for all. And my grandparents um, have died happy people, knowing that the next generation and the next generation of Palestinians will continue to raise our voices and to continue to fight for a free Palestine. Um, and I am grateful that I have been given the opportunities that I have been given to continue to be that voice. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to come back to the uh, women's March, but as long as you talked about uh, your uh, grandmother and your grandparents, 
the memories you share about the summers spent with your family, especially your grandmothers in the uh, little Palestinian village of Albira, uh, just a few miles north of Jerusalem. How have those memories uh, shaped you? And if you don't mind, share too about the significant, uh, 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 share too about uh, the significance of the olive beads you wear on your right wrist, a, a gift from your beloved Basima. Uh, how, I guess, Linda, what I'm asking you to share with us is how do you care, how do you carry Palestine in your heart? Talk to us about that. So, um they're actually not in the same room that I'm in right now, but I have um, these bracelets that are little balls made out of the scraps of olive trees that were gifted to me by my mentor who passed away in a very tragic car accident back in 2005. And they um, represent something that is very significant to Palestinian culture and the Palestinian history, which are olive trees. Olive trees, as you know, are very important to the Palestinian people. They are trees that can live for thousands and thousands of years. And they are also one of the most deeply rooted trees. The, 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 the roots of olive trees are very deep and, can, and go deeper than many other trees. And so the Basima gave me those to remind me always. And she had a foresight for me um, that one day you are going to be a very powerful leader and voice and you will be attacked and you will be disparage and you will be discouraged and you will be marginalized and remember that you are a Palestinian and that you these olive trees represent who you are a deeply rooted person with a history that goes back thousands of years and so those bracelets mean a lot to me that's one thing that I carry with me every day and another thing Michael is you probably have heard me speak at many events across the country one of the things and I said this at the women's march the day on 20 in 2017 I said I stand here before you unapologetically Palestinian American. And so my, my Palestinian identity goes with me everywhere, Michael, because it's who I am. And I'm not gonna hide that part of my identity because it makes some people feel uncomfortable. I am entitled to be a full human being and to bring all my identities to the table. And, and, and when I do that, it allows others, Michael, to do the same, not just Palestinians, but it allows someone to be unapologetically black and unapologetically Latina and maybe unapologetically Latina, LGBTQIA, and, and, and maybe a, a, someone who's a, per, a proud, progressive Jew, you know, whatever it is that you are, you get to be all of you. And I'm trying to model what it means to be unapologetic. And the time that you spent with your grandmothers in, in Albira, and do you want to uh, let it, say a little bit more about that? Those summers that you spent there, you refer to that quite movingly in your book. Um. You know, I have had the privilege of being part of a Palestinian family. My Both my parents are immigrants to the United States who felt the need and the importance of us traveling to Palestine almost every summer. So I am a fluent Arab, uh, excuse me, I'm a fluent Arabic speaker. Not only do I speak the fluent Arabic language, I also speak fluent dialect um, from my Palestinian village that I come from, which is El Bire outside of Ramallah. And I think that, um, my village where I, you know, I was able to really experience things that a lot of young people don't experience at my age. And I mean, I wrote about, you know, going to visit my uncle when I was eight, in, in, seven years old in 1987, my uncle was in a um, Israeli prison. Um, he was picked up with a group of uh, men that had, was never charged of any crime, never had a, never had a trial, never saw a judge, just, just detained uh, for an indefinite period of time. And of course, eventually released. And so to meet my uncle behind bars and trying to understand what it means to be Palestinian, to live under a military occupation. I also went um, to, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, Jerusalem and to kind of be connected to my faith tradition and to see how in Jerusalem, the coexistence of different faith traditions, you know, whether it be going to the church of nativity, seeing the wall, and of course going to um, the both mosques there. And so, Palestine is, is, is not just something theoretical to me, Michael, or something that as a Palestinian American, I know about from afar, I've experienced that I lived it. I've seen the Israeli military in our villages. I've uh, experienced, um, you know, at night, I remember being in Palestine in 2014. And I remember, you know, the, 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 what do you call it? The curfews, you know, the not being able to go outside and trying to explain to my own children at the time who were very young, like, what do you mean we can't go outside? And having to explain to them what it means to live under a military occupation. And so I have, it has shaped my views on the world. And, 
And my village is a beautiful village um, that has, uh, it is right, f- five minutes outside of Ramallah. It is part of the occupied West Bank. Um, and in order for people in my family to travel there, uh, especially if they are born Palestinians, my son, derivative of his father, who was born in Palestine, my son, who's an American, has Palestinian documentation, which means that my American child born in Brooklyn is not allowed to go to Tel Aviv airport to go to Palestine to visit his grandparents. He has to go to Jordan and cross the bridge in. And so these types of injustices are things that I've been talking to, talking about in my experience traveling to Palestine. And really a lot of people in this country, Michael, don't even know these experiences. And when they hear them, they're absolutely, they're like, what is? what do you mean? You're an American, you should get to go to, go to any airport that you want. But Palestinian Americans are banned from going to travel to their own homeland through the Tel Aviv airport built on a village that was destroyed by the Israeli government. I mean, the irony of it is, you know. Let me, let me take you back to the Women's March. Uh, you, you write very frankly that in organizing the Women's March and in its aftermath, there were things that uh, Carmen, Tamika, Bob Bland, and you, uh, I don't know how else to say it, but things that you had to teach your white feminist partners. And that work still continues. Uh, what are some of the lessons that you're finding you still need to teach white men and women and also just men and women of privilege? You know, I think we've come a long way, but that test is going to be in 2020 um, to see if we really did, you know, got to a better place, Michael, on these issues. You know, right now, as you know, we're, we're celebrating the 100th anniversary um, of, of the of women's right to vote. And what a lot of people always forget is that it's, it's only the 100th anniversary of the white women's right to vote. And in fact, um, women of color and black women didn't get the right to vote till decades later. And so I think what we've been really talking to white women about in particular over the years is really trying to give them an, an opportunity to look at issues through a racial justice lens. You know, so issues around equal pay, for example, of course, I want women to get paid the same as men for the same work and same qualifications. But we act, we also have to ponder on the fact that black women still don't get paid the same as white women and women, uh, immigrant women don't get paid the same as black and white women. So what we re- really did across the time um, that we were at the Women's March is trying to explain to white women that criminal justice reform is a feminist issue. Climate justice is a feminist issue. You know, uh, global justice and an end to wars is a woman's issue. And oftentimes in the, in the larger kind of more white led feminist movement, they've been very specific about reproductive rights, equal pay and issues that are not very intersectional. And I think my role has been as an intersectional leader is to bring white women along to basically say to them, listen, your liberation in the United States of America for you to have full control over your life, over your body is intertwined with those of black women and women, other women of color and other marginalized women. And I think we've got made some progress, um, but unfortunately, there are some um, white women who are maybe a little threatened by the leadership of women of color because we are, you know, quite radical in our politics and the way that we organize. And you know why, Michael? Because we have to be. We don't have time to wait. We can't, you know, try. We can't. We, this incrementalism just doesn't work for us anymore. We've had too many people in our community deported, too many black people being killed on the streets of our communities, too many wars that have killed millions of people across the world, including almost a million Iraqis in an unjust war that we shouldn't have had in the first place. And we are, you know, women of color are committed to diplomacy over war. I mean, the military industrial complex in this country has taken resources away from hospitals, from 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 social service programs that we need in this country. When, when, when I go to Chicago and you tell me I had to shut down 10 schools in Chicago, but we still figure out how to find $10 million a day to give to Israel, like somebody has to be able to explain this to the American people. It doesn't work. Um, and the fact that the large majority of our, our of our military aid goes to Egypt and goes to 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 Israel, but then we can't have health care for all people during a global pandemic. Like we still live in a country where people don't support this idea of Medicare for all. Like, how is it possible that almost 200,000 Americans have died, Michael? Some of them people we love from a global pandemic. Some people dying without health care. It's not okay. Um, and so, so, so that's kind of the, 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 the courageous conversation we've had to have, have with white women. We've also had to have the conversation around Israel-Palestine. You know, as a women's march, as you know, we were a protest movement, Michael. That was the point of the women's march. And so in the, in the platform of the women's march, we did say that we will not stand by at the criminalization of any protesters and Americans who want to engage in the boycott, divestment, sanctions movement. Not because 
uh, it, not just BDS on Israel, but BDS on Saudi Arabia, BDS on China when it comes to their treatment of Uyghur Muslims. You know, we boycott is part of a long tradition of nonviolent resistance to human rights violations. And so if you're going to be against BDS when it comes to Palestine, then were you against the BDS when it came to the Montgomery bus boycott or South African apartheid? And so I don't want, I don't expect everyone to agree with us, Michael. But what I do expect white folks in particular, white Jews and white you know, Christians and others is to understand that our liberation is bound up together. There's no way around it. Um, you know, and our in our Jewish sisters and brothers, you know, particularly those who are white Jews, and I'm, I've had this courageous conversation, Michael, many times, you know, they have conditional whiteness, you know, that you can be white, but it's very conditional. This is a nation that has many times often has sent and signaled to Jewish communities, we have an anti-Semite in the White House right now, we know in the 1930s, we sent Jewish refugees back to Europe. You know, we have seen an uptick in anti-Semitic attacks against uh, Jewish communities and synagogues. And so when I say to people and I say to my sisters and brothers in the Jewish community, our liberation is bound up with one another. And guess what? When the when when the bad stuff really happens, Michael, guess who's going to be out there fighting with my life for the people of this country? It is going to be me because that's what I've been doing for the last 24 for, for the last 20 years of my life. And I'm going to continue to do that to the last days of my life. Let me, by the way, there's so many uh, comments in the chat room of love and affection and support coming from your friends all around the country. So I, I wanted you to be aware of that. Um, let, let me follow up what you just said. Uh, you write, and I, I found this to be, I've quoted this already a number of times with small groups that I've been involved with. You write that you've, I'm quoting now, developed one tried and true principle, follow black women, trust black women. Black women will never lead you astray. So uh, say, say more about that and especially the overlap between the goals of the Black Lives Movement and those of Muslims and Palestinians and really of all marginalized peoples. You know, when I think about all the movements that I'm a part of, Michael, majority of the movements that I'm a part of um, is are led by Black women, and they have put in a lot of labor, and they're very they're willing to sacrifice a lot for our movement. We also watched them in the 2016 election. 94 percent of Black women went to the polls and voted for Hillary Clinton. Not because 94% of Black women thought Hillary Clinton was the best candidate or that she was the most amazing thing that ever happened to us. They voted for Hillary Clinton because they knew it was the right thing to do to alleviate the harm that this administration was going to commit against marginalized people. They also believed that the Clinton administration was going to be an administration that might have absolutely been status quo, but that would not have elevated the harms that were already happening to Black people in immigrant communities, et cetera. And so oftentimes we have watched black women step up and do the right thing and all over and over on the behalfs of all of us. And it's time for us just to follow their leadership. And what's the worst that's gonna happen, Michael? I mean, when I was watching the DNC convention and I listened to Michelle Obama, I, I thought, you know, I was, it, 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 she, she moved me to a deep place. I mean, this is a woman who's brilliant um, and understands, you know, the struggles that we're going through right now. I watched the brilliance of the Ayanna Presleys and the Ilhan Omars and the, you know, Karen Basses and the Barbara Lees in Congress. I want to remind people that immediately after the horrific attacks of 9-11, Barbara Lee, Congresswoman Barbara Lee, singly, one person, she was the only vote against the war, war on Afghanistan. A black woman stood up in a Congress that has 437 people and by herself stood up against the entire Congress and said, I vote no on the war on Afghanistan. That is who black women are. They are willing to, to speak the truth. They are willing to do the work. And it is about time that we stop making them take on all the labor that all of us should be in. And that is why I follow their leadership. I pick up whatever they don't want to do. I support their labor. I want to make sure that the burden that they carry is not as heavy as it has been for the last 400 years. And I truly believe that one day we are going to have a black woman president in America. And that is truly when real change is going to come to our communities. One of the things I, I really appreciated in your book was you, you, know, you not only embrace uh, coalition building, but also strong personal bonds of mentoring, 
partnerships, loyalty, loyalty, what, what a virtue, and, and friendship. So various names, Dr. Jobber, Harry Belafonte, John Lewis, your beloved Basima, and your, you call them your sisterhood, Carmen and Tamika. Say more about not just coalition building, but these personal bonds that have really shaped you and that you try to emulate in your own activism. Absolutely, Michael. I mean, one of the things about me is based on the consistent attacks that I've received over the last maybe 10 years from the right wing, I'm technically a person that shouldn't even be talking to you right now. Like I'm a person that should have kind of been totally marginalized and erased from any kind of conversations or any platforms, you know. And the reason why I'm still here, Michael, is because I have built very deep relationships, like deep relationships and friendships across communities, across racial groups, across issue groups, across faith groups. I'm a person, Michael, that when you are in my presence, you are the most important thing to me. I want people to feel valued in my presence. I want you to feel seen. I want you to feel like there is someone, even if it's one person, and that person is me, that there's someone that cares about you. And when people are with me in real life, Michael, like actually know me, they know that I will go beyond, up and beyond, and beyond myself and my own means to take care of people, right? And to support people. And, and it is also my public track record. I have been an organizer for the last 20 years, and I have been part of every major movement in the last 20 years. I have been a leader in the immigrant rights movement. I have defended the immigrant, immigrant rights movement, uh, uh, lobbied on policies. I've been arrested in civil disobedience probably 30 times um, in my very short life. And I am ready to give up everything that I have for the things that I believe in. And my relationships allow me to do that, Michael. I know I'm supported. I know I'm loved. And I know the people who matter to me are the ones are the only ones that matter, the people who I have relationships with. And so I'm grateful to have the support of Black leaders, um, of Latino leaders, of Jewish leaders across the country. I am proud to be defended by progressive movements and progressive organizations like the ACLU, like the Sunrise Movement, like Move On and some of the large progressive organizations. And again, that all goes back to conversations. It all goes back to um, deep relationships. And I, I and that's kind of a charge that I have for people, Michael. And I'll give you an example. Even during a global pandemic, I live on a street in Brooklyn that has a lot of senior citizens. That's just the street that I happen to live on. And immediately when the pandemic kind of got hot in New York, and as you know, it escalated quickly in New York City. It was a very devastating about three months for us. I took, a, I took some index cards and I wrote in hand, I didn't type it up, I wrote it with my hand. And I said to my neighbors, hello, I'm your neighbor from this address and here's my name. I want you to know that I'm here for you. If you need a grocery sauce, or a grocery run or you need someone to pick up something from the pharmacy or you need someone just to come and say hello, I'm here and I put my cell phone number on it. And I went to every house on my block and I put that card in ev under every door in my, in my and, and people believe it or not immediately called me. Like the minute they got the card and they said, they said, thank you so much. Oh my God. And there were people in my in my street, Michael, who have no family and may not have been able, and some of them were not even able to get their Meals on Wheels program because for the beginning of the pandemic, those programs were uh, temporarily uh, seizing. And so the, my neighbors, other neighbors of mine who are um, people that I know and I can organize who are younger, we started cooking for our neighbors. And this is something that I want people to understand. This is this is the kind of country I wanna live in, Michael. If something happens to me, I want my neighbors to be able to come to my home and be able to say, I'm here for you, what do you need? If I have an undocumented neighbor, I want my undocumented neighbor to know that if ICE comes to their house, they can call me and I will 100% put my body in front of an undocumented family so that the ICE people don't drag them away. And so d d relationships is all we have, Michael. That's the strength of, our neighborhoods, our communities, it will be the strength of our democracy if we figure out how to get along, even when we don't agree on everything. You write very movingly about some of the great highs you've experienced. We've had a question here, uh, for example, in addition to the Women's March, your, your walk in April 2015 uh, as part of your 250 mile March to Justice and the, general, and the generous hospitality of the people at the Al Hidayah Mosque in Northern Philadelphia. So I, I, I know that there's a question out there to, for you to share about that. You also give us a window, though, into the deep lows you've known, the, fati the fatigue, the name calling, the threats. So how, how, say a word about how you stay grounded and where do you find your strength and hope? 
So there's a couple of different layers there of that question. The, the, the walk from uh, 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 New York to uh, uh, DC, but also then this groundedness. So if folks remember back in 2014, um, there was a man in New York City named Eric Garner who was murdered at the hands of the New York Police Department. He was actually choked to death. And in, many of you saw the video where he said 11 times that he can't breathe. And then there was a non-indictment. So a man, a police officer chokes a black man on video for the whole world to watch, Michael, and, he, and the cop goes free. And so some young black organizers that I organized with, we were at a meeting and they said this, they said they were so deflated and they felt so, it was really just a sad you know, experience for me. And one of them said, we have to do something crazy, something um, that we need to bring awareness to this issue. So Tamika jumps into the conversation, says, you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna march from New York City to Washington DC with three pieces of federal legislation. And we're gonna march um, on foot 20 miles, about 20, 21 miles, sometimes 23 miles a day. Uh, and we did that. And that march was a spiritual journey for me, Michael. The majority of the people who marched with us were people of color, some college students who left university. We had some union members, you know, other, other organizers. Um, you know, we had some Jewish allies, white allies that came along. And about 100 to 150 of us marched um, through five states over the course of about 11 days. And it was one of the most inspiring moments of my organizing career because I got to experience a lot of things, Michael, that... I needed to experience to really understand how, uh, how, how, how high the mountain is that we're gonna need to climb. We walked through a part of Maryland called um, uh, uh, Rising Sun, Maryland, which is home to the Ku Klux Klan. And as we were walking down Route 1, every house that we passed had a Confederate flag. There were people outside of their homes who were yelling things at us, calling us the N-word, saying that we were on welfare, that we needed to go back where we came from. At one point, we saw a little purple vehicle that said KKK, cupcake cart, on the back of it. And eventually, we end up at um, a university that night, and I, it was we were in the chapel, and the young Black kids who were part of my group burst out into tears. And at that moment, they were truly able to experience what their ancestors experienced walking through this part of, of Maryland. And so anyway, that, 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 that journey was something that also proved what we are willing to put on the line. I marched on my knees, on my feet for 250 miles, and I'm willing to do that again and again and again if I have to. Um, and it was an, a wonderful experience. And that moves me to the things that give me hope. What I say to people all the time, Michael, is it's not hope that moves me. I actually believe hope is something that is almost like a mirage. Like you can't really see hope. I don't, hope is not a vision, right? What moves me, Michael, is love. And I have children and I have a beautiful family that I love very much. And I always say to people, what moves me is love. And for me also from a faith perspective, I believe God is love. And so until I stop loving my family and loving God, I'm gonna keep doing this work. I am moved by this idea that when I wake up in the morning and I talk to my kids, whether it be virtually or in person, that I love them so much that I'm willing to sacrifice everything that I have so that they live in a country that truly respects them for who they are. I wanna live in a country you know, that loves black people, that loves indigenous people, that loves people from marginalized communities. Because at the end of the day, Michael, I think we have gotten beyond this idea of being tolerated in this country this is our country and our country has to love us in the same way that we love this country. And that brings me to another very important point, Michael, that I wanna make. You know, One of the criticisms that people have of me is that they say, well, if you don't like it here, why don't you go back to where you came from? Well, the bottom line is I did come from Brooklyn. So that's just to be clear. Um, that, is, that is where I'm from and where I was born and, and, where, and where, I, where I tell people, if that's where you want me to go back to, Brooklyn's where I'm going. But what I say to people also, you know, they say to me, you know, you're anti-American, you know, you take this country for granted. And I say to people, I don't take this country for granted. I'm very grateful, actually, Michael, that my parents decided to come here to the United States of America to give me these opportunities. But just because I don't take this country for granted, I also am rooted in the history of this country. And I don't, and I'm not going to, you know, you know, I'm not going to be in a space to not remember that this country was founded on the extermination of indigenous people, 
that this country was founded on the enslavement of black people and you know the exclusion of the Chinese and the internment of the Japanese and on Jim Crow and on mass incarceration and on you know so many other things. And so what I say to people all the time that when they people try to debate patriotism with me, I, Michael, am a patriot. And in fact, what if there were a photo in the dictionary next to the word patriot, it would have my photo next to it. And I'll tell you why. Because for me, a patriot, Michael, is someone who loves their country so much that they are willing to wake up every single day to push their country to be the best nation in the world. And until my country respects every resident that resides here with us and where we are able to provide the basic human rights to all people that includes healthcare, I am going to continue to do this work. So I'm trying to love my country to be better. And that may need to mean that I have to criticize my country and I have to fight the leaders of my country to really uphold the original ideals. You know, um, you worked most of your adult life <clears throat> uh, organizing, protesting structural problems and inequalities in law enforcement, the legal system, uh, policing. Uh, I wanted to ask you about that, but as you were talking, it, it uh, occurs to me that the contact tracing and other technologies that are being touted as part of the solution to a COVID crisis uh, by public health, health officials, these could be real threats uh, to communities of Muslims and African Americans and peoples of color. So could you address both of those aspects of your work? I'm sorry, could you ask me that again? Ask me that I, on my internet. Yeah. Was I was trying to sit down here. Yeah. Uh, uh, you, you're, you, most of your adult life has been spent working with uh, uh, policing, the legal system, inequalities in law enforcement, uh, and, and the like. But as you were talking, it occurred to me that the technologies and contact tracing that are being touted as part of the solution to the COVID crisis by public health officials, they could be used uh, as threats to Muslim Americans, uh, uh, African Americans and, and other peoples of color. So, could you address both of those activist, both of those aspects of your activism? Absolutely. I mean, one of the things I also write about in my book, Michael, is the unwarranted surveillance program um, implemented by the New York Police Department against our Muslim communities. It was to the point where police officers within the NYPD leaked thousands of documents that were red flags for them. Um, that really. Um, showed that the New York Police Department was targeting us simply by the fact that we were Muslim. So they were targeting the 250, over 250 mosques, community centers, Islamic schools, Muslim student associations, you name it, the NYPD was on it. And not only has the New York Police Department had a history of the unwarranted surveillance of Muslims, but you know they have a history of the surveillance of political activists and COINTELPRO and informant programs and that has been going on for decades. And of course, the Black people of New York City can tell you a lot more about it than I can. I mean, even going back to the days of Malcolm X, um, we know that um, you know, the infiltration of the, you know, the Nation of Islam and the Black Panther Party and other kind of Black liberation groups at the time. And so when I hear, and then we also know that even under, you know, uh, since 9-11, the Patriot Act, right, that really strips us of a lot, many of our civil liberties the, the work that the NSA has done, um, you know, tracking uh, a lot of, you know, ordinary Americans and not, you know what I mean? So I, I, I'm always a person that's very weary when I hear about contact tracing, right? And I'm very weary about the type of reach that we give the government when it comes to our lives. And I think that we as the American people cannot continue to be sheep. And every time somebody just gives us a program, we're like, cool, track me, you know, what do you want to do next? Put a microchip in my body, you know, like, we really have to assert our constitutional rights and our rights to privacy um, and, 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 and that have really been violated in the name of national security. And the, 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 when we talk about national security, Michael, in this country, the, it's interesting how national security is always in the context of Islam, you know, Muslims and terrorism. But then nobody thinks the national security threat is the multiple shootings that we've had over the last few years that have really all been committed majority by white men and white supremacists. That doesn't seem to be a national security threat to anybody, even though we've had uh, white supremacists walk into churches and kill innocent worshipers, walking in to synagogues and killing innocent, innocent Jewish worshipers, harass, you know, killing all kinds of diverse people at malls and movie theaters. And really, we, we're not really safe anywhere in our school systems, 
and the and the somehow the United States government hasn't figured out how to create any solutions around or any gun reform laws or anything around protecting us from the gun violence coming from white supremacists, but seem to really easily violate our civil liberties in the name of any uh, of Muslim terrorism or I wouldn't call it Muslim terrorism, but terrorism in, that is committed by people who identify as Muslim. So that's a problem. And I'm not going to um, I'm not one of those people that just easily takes on anything. We have a question here about uh, um, how's well, I'm going to just read the question in the chat room. How's the situation of Bay Ridge, Brooklyn, your neighborhood, as to your representation on the city council? I'm thinking of the fine documentary, Brooklyn, Inshallah, about the 2016 council election, where you worked hard to awaken Arabs and Muslims to register and vote for candidates, uh, 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 vote for the candidate who came from Bethlehem. So anyway, uh, say a little bit about your work very, very much locally. That's where I came from, uh, Michael. I came as a local organizer. I'm a person that really holds both. I'm not just a na I'm not a pundit. I'm not a, just a you know a national talking head. I'm a grassroots organizer from the streets of Southwest Brooklyn, which is my neighborhood, Bay Ridge, and it is home to one of the largest Arab American and Muslim American communities in the state of New York. Um, we have done uh, such such powerful work to build up the power of Arab American and Muslim American voters in the district. I have registered thousands of voters and new Americans in the area. I have ran candidates in the area. I have helped to defeat two Republicans in my district. At, at one point, every single representative who represented me in my district, whether on the not, on the federal or local level, have been Republicans. So now we have um, our member of Congress is, um, we flipped the Republican seat in Congress. We have now flipped a, a Republican seat in our state legislator in my district at the hands of the power that the Arab American and Muslim American communities are building in mind. And so I'm very proud to be from Brooklyn and from Bay Ridge. Um, Bay Ridge is actually an interesting place. It's a place that's experiencing the opposite of gentrification. And what I mean by that is in a lot of parts of New York City, as you know, um, a lot of the you know traditional old black community um, and you know the traditional black community or you know old Puerto Rican communities and other kind of communities that we have in New York. Um, are now being gentrified by you know wh white folks, particularly young white people. And my neighborhood has the opposite. We are actually going. We are in a traditionally white neighborhood: Norwegian, Greek, Italian community, Irish community, and are now uh, uh, are are now ha have an influx of Arab American, Muslim American, uh, Latino, and Asian American folks coming into the community. So it's really beautiful to see how diverse my community has become and my neighborhood has become over the course of the last almost twenty years. We've had a number of questions uh, in the chat room about um, Joe Biden, Kamala Harris, the DNC, their stands on Palestine and Israel, and your um, your work as a delegate, and then your activism work uh, building up to the November election. So talk to us a little bit about just your take now as a delegate. And uh, I mean, we all know who are, who are on this call that Joe Biden and Kamala Harris are no friends of the Palestinians uh, and haven't been. In fact, they've received so much support from APAC and other supporters of Israel. But so on the other hand, uh, uh, we, wanna, we wanna work against fascism, do we not? And so uh, you're, you've been a delegate for, you were a spokesperson for Bernie Sanders. Talk to us a little bit about your activism from now until November and then beyond. Absolutely. You know, Michael, everybody plays a different role in this movement. Um, and I'm never going to be an ambassador to the Democratic Party until the Democratic Party speaks to the issues that communities I come from uh, care about and also respects the, and the communities that I come from. And so I always say to people, I'm what they call a small letter D. I'm not a capital D. Um, and I understand the Democratic Party as a tool for us to continue to build power and build influence around the issues that we care about. I am a very proud delegate for Bernie Sanders from the great state of New York. I am someone who uh, supported Bernie Sanders back in 2015, 2016, when it was not popular. And I continue to be very close to Bernie over the last few years and really I'm moved by his commitment and consistency and persistency over the last four decades when it has come to pretty much every issue. Um, I, uh, as a delegate for the convention, just so that I'm quite you know, transparent, I voted number one for Bernie Sanders as you know, my nominee. I also voted no against the Democratic platform. 
And that is what democracy looks like. I did not go to be a delegate so that I could just fall in line, Michael. And that's the problem that we have every four years that we are all expected just to fall in line. It's not going to work anymore. But I also understand that this is not any old election. This is an election about whether we are, as a country, are going to accept four more years of fascism. And I'm, I'm a bigger person and I understand how much harm this administration has accelerated on the communities that I come from and organize with. So my role really has been in the larger electoral sphere is to convince progressives, and I don't mean the progressives except for Palestine, I mean progressives, the real progressives, and also Muslim and Arab American and Palestinian communities. I have convinced, I've tried to convince them that that, that when, I, when, when we're voting in a presidential election, Michael, we're not voting for who the best president is going to be. Or at least that's not, we haven't gotten to the place where we're actually voting for the best person. And I mean right now in this general election. What I have framed for people is that this is an election about who do you want your opponent in the White House to be? And I am choosing my opponent to be Biden because I don't believe that we can move anything under a Trump administration. You can't move a fascist, Michael. You just can't. Yeah. It doesn't work. It's never worked. There's no there's no example of any of it anywhere around the world where some progressive movement was able to build enough power to move a fascist. Fascists can do horrible, horrible things to people. And I'm not going to be a part of that. So what I've been saying to progressives who have actually really, um, you know, reflected on my framing is that Biden is not a friend to the Palestinian people. Biden is a hawk when it comes to wars and he voted for the war in Iraq. Um, and he doesn't support Medicare for all. And I can go on and on. But what I do believe, Michael, is that we could build a very strong, consistent movement around the Biden-Harris administration to force their hand to do the right thing. Because we did not do that, Michael, under the Obama administration. What happened with Obama, as you know, is we were too busy embracing this historic moment of electing the first black president, which I was very proud of. And we also knew a lot about Obama. We knew that he was a constitutional lawyer we knew that he was an organizer from the South side of Chicago. He was black, which meant that he was a member of a marginalized community. And we put a lot of hope in him and we really left him out to dry. We, we, we expected him to do the right thing because what, 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 what else would he do? And he eventually got surrounded by, you know, some of the old traditional folks in the democratic party. We didn't give him a movement of resistance outside, except maybe for a couple of elements like the, like the undocumented kids did and kind of forced his hand to do some things. But overall, we didn't, Michael. The anti-war movement went to bed. A lot of our movements kind of were dormant a little bit. And then we expected him to do the right thing, and he didn't do the right thing many times. And so what I'm saying to people is I'm not going to be that person. I'm going to be part of a resistance under the Trump, under the, excuse me, well, of course, under the Trump administration, if that is to happen. But I will, I will be a thorn in the side of Biden and Harris when they get into that White House. I remember when we hosted Stephen Zunas, uh, uh, the political scientist here, uh, at the very beginning of the Obama administration, uh, what was it now, 12 years ago or so, and he said he had had a private conversation with Barack Obama, and Obama confided to him over dinner one night that, that progressives, activists, needed to something like, it's almost an exact quote, build a critical enough mass so that would give him permission to do the right thing he knew he needed to do, something like that. And I think that's what you're talking about. Uh, just a couple more questions, uh, Linda. So the, the DNC and Biden and Harris, uh, we need to hold their feet to the fire. Yet there have been some positive signs, right? The Elliot Engel was ousted by Jamal Bowman in New York. Two of your buddies, right? Rashida Tlaib and Ilhan Omar, uh, won their primaries, as did Cori Bush, African-American woman in Missouri who beat out William Lacey Clay, a 12-term, a right, uh, uh, pro-Israel African-American, and Betty McCollum, too, and some of her colleagues, including Indiana's Andre Carson, have introduced the Israeli Annexation Non-Recognition non -recognition Act. So there are hopeful signs. There have been signs that BBS is continuing to work. So talk to us a little bit more about these heartening signs and the work that still needs to be done. You know, even this whole recent um, 
couple of days around the DNC and my presence at, as, at the DNC as an official delegate um, at the Muslim Assembly, you know, the, the backlash is what I call the last gasps of air from the right wing. And if it makes them, if it made them feel any better that the Biden administration was like, Linda's not part of the campaign and we support Israel, if that made them feel better, well, I hope they enjoy that. Because what really is happening in our country is that more people, Michael, are aligning with my politics. You know, more prog more progressives than ever before are more courageously talking about free Palestine. More progressives are supporting the boycott, divestment, sanctions movement, and. So we are in a, in, a, in a moment right now when you can take someone like Cori Bush, who is a brilliant black woman from St. Louis. She was the Ferguson protester, supporter of Palestinian human rights, supporter of the BDS movement, and is a democratic socialist who beats Clay, who, as you know, is not only is he a 12 term incumbent, he is he came after his father. We're right. talking about a 50 year dynasty in Congress. You know, Elliot Engel is is or was, I should say one of the most influential members of Congress. He was around for a really long time. He was the chair of the foreign, House Foreign Relations Committee and, you know, had a lot of resources and, you know, a lot of support in Congress. And here comes a brilliant young Black man who's a principal of a middle school in New York who says, I want to be the change that I want to see, who ran as a democratic socialist, who supports the Palestinian people and human rights of the Palestinian people. He su supports the idea of conditioning aid to Israel um, in order to push them to stop violating the human rights of the Palestinian people. Ilhan and Rashida, Michael, were called vulnerable. Ilhan, AOC, and Rashida, according to every media pundit and every an political analyst, were vulnerable. Not only were they not vulnerable, they crushed every pro-Israel lobby organization in America, single-handedly. And so, all, so what gives me that kind of sense of optimism that I have is that instead of me becoming more fringe, I'm the one moving more towards the mainstream and they're the ones moving to the fringe. And I'm okay with that, Michael. And it's gonna maybe take a few more years for the voices of peace and justice to be mainstream in the Democratic Party. But what I will tell you is that if you thought, 20, if you thought from 2018 to 2020 was spicy in Congress, wait until you hear Jamal Bowman and Cori Bush in Congress. Like it's gonna be amazing what we're gonna be able to see and the type of courage that we're gonna hear in the next two years. I just have two more quick questions for you, Linda. You've been very gracious with your time and I appreciate it. I, I did wanna have you uh, have an opportunity to say something about uh, William Barber, Reverend William Barber and the Poor People's Campaign. We've interviewed Reverend Liz Theo Harris uh, in this space, uh, Reverend Barber's co-chair and uh, uh, of course, we're very supportive of the Poor People's Campaign here. Talk about your relationship with Reverend Barber and uh, what you've learned from your work with the Poor People's Campaign. Um, Reverend Barber is one of my mentors. I talk about, about him in my book and he's in my acknowledgments as well. He is a brilliant leader. He's kind of like an MLK of our time. And I'm very honored to know him, to have organized with him and to have went to, to the border to visit immigrant children who were separated from their mothers. I mean, we've done some very deep work together. Um, you know, the Poor People's Campaign is an important campaign in this country. And I hope I wish that more people just joined and were a part of it. Because what Reverend Barber tried to do or is trying to do and has done so, so at, at, at some level is he's tried to um, revamp or, re, re, or, or relaunch the Poor People's Campaign that Dr. Martin Luther King was not able to continue because he was assassinated. As you remember, Michael, that Dr. Martin Luther King was good for the white folks until he started organizing white folks. When he was just organizing black people, he was fine. Oh, go get some rights for the black people, we're good. The minute that Dr. Martin Luther King started being more intersectional in his approach and st started seeing how that the liberation of black people and poor black people in America was intertwined with the liberation of white poor people in America and started bringing these communities together, he was just getting too powerful. And so the status quo at, in America at the time was like, we're gonna stop you right here. And eventually it, it, it went to the point where he was unfortunately assassinated um, and we lost a great leader. And so, so what, 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 um, what Dr. Barber is doing is he's really saying the only way we can win in this country is if we build intersectional movements and we, organize our, across all marginalized people and all poor people in America, including white poor people. And so that's why I support that movement. I've been a part of it. Again, I've marched and I've gotten arrested in civil disobedience with the Poor People's Campaign. And I'm proud to be a Muslim American representing in that larger campaign. 
one last question. Um, you, uh, you write in your book that you often play a game with, with yourself called 50 years. Um, talk to us about 50 years. I, I play that game with myself, um, Michael, because I think it's an important game for us, or at least an important question to ask ourselves as often as we can. Because one thing that I do know, Michael, is that I might not see the fruits of my labor. And that's okay with me, but I have seen some fruits of my labor. And so I might not even live 50, I might not even live till 50 more years. I don't know. But what I do envision every day as I organize to give myself optimism and to give myself something to strive for is I think about the world that I want to live in 50 years from now. And that world, Michael, is a beautiful place. It's a place that has no poverty. It's a place where we all have health care. I always, when I think about 50 years from now, I think of the, the giggles of, of children of all race, racial backgrounds, religious backgrounds, no religious backgrounds, just giggling and laughing and playing together in a society where there is no wars, where you don't have to worry about being killed with a gun. 50 years from now, I can see a society that has learned restorative justice, right? That we don't have to cage people who have made mistakes, even some of the most horrible mistakes. And so 50 years from now is just a country that is um, just we're a country where we don't have to fight for justice because justice is already the law of the land. And that's the country that I work towards every day. And, and maybe that won't be uh, here 50 years from now, but that doesn't mean we don't fight for it, Michael. And it may happen a hundred years from now. It might happen 200 years from now. All I know, Michael, is that wh whenever it happens, I will know that I was a part of it many, many, many years ago, even if I'm not I'm no longer on this earth. You talk about it as the single most important task you have as a mother and as an organizer to make that kind of place a reality. Yeah. That's one of the most important, you know, identities that I had. Um, I am responsible for other human beings, Michael, and that's how I live my life every day. And so my children have endured a lot, um, things that no child, no children should have to endure. Um, you know, my children, you know, Michael have to endure seeing such hateful things about their mom. Um, and they know me, they're my children, they know who I am, they know my character, they know, they know everything about me. And they have endured um, threats, they have had to see mail come to the home to our home. Um, they have seen death threats and in, in, in letters um, that they may have, I may have told them to open at some point to check the mail when I'm not home to see if there are any bills or if anyone needs me. And, you know, I, I don't ask anyone for anything but to pray for my kids um, and I and to pray that they one day will experience a country where they don't have to, you know, feel ashamed or afraid to be Muslim and to be Arab American and to be Palestinian in this country. Linda, thank you for coming today. Do you have any parting words for us? I just want everyone, you know, to know that we have to stay fighting and we have to be consistent and we have to remember that our opposition, those who are united around divisiveness and hate and hate and, you know, dividing us by, you know, in, in, you know, by groups, you know, and pitting us up against each other. We have to be as intense as, as them. And we and we are as progressives and those of us who care about peace and justice have to be able to put our money where our mouth is, organize across differences. Um, and remember that we are not outward, we are not outnumbered, Michael, we are just out organized by our opposition. And I just want people to, 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 to take this with them as they listen to me. And sometimes you will absolutely disagree with me and you have every right to disagree with things that I say, but remember that unity is not uniformity and that you do not have to agree with everything that everybody says in order for you to be, feel that you are, uh, you know, that you are united with them. And so I'm trying, I'm not trying to build a united movement where we are all the same and we all agree. I'm trying to build a movement where we can respect each other across our differences and fight for justice for the most marginalized people. Once again, Linda Sarsour, thank you. Uh, and friends, thank all of you for joining us today. We'll be in touch with news of other interviews with justice advocates and change makers in the weeks to come. So thank you all for joining us today.